I'm Mitch Silber. I'm the executive director of the Community Security Initiative, and glad that you're here today to spend some time with us to talk about the active threat issue and to receive this online training. Uh, we all know that online Zoom training for this uh, is not nearly as good as in person, um, but given the overwhelming demand that we have for uh, training, we thought we would at least do a couple Zooms as soon as we could so that people have some of the basic elements, some of the basic principles in place, and then uh, we'll, we'll want to follow up with institutions in our catchment area here. Please contact your regional security manager. We'll put a link in the chat to sign up for an in-person uh, training for staff. The way that we're looking at this is that in the first phase, we want to do training with leadership and staff. Uh, most institutions aren't fully open yet. And then there'd be a second, a second type of training, potentially with members or students or congregants, uh, potentially also with law enforcement. Uh, so that's, that's to come. But um, I want to start off by thanking uh, UJA Federation of New York and JCRC of New York. Um, both organizations are the partners in having created the Community Security Initiative. Actually, I think today is our two-year anniversary uh, since our founding and, and launched in February of 2020. Uh, there's been a lot of ground that's covered, but fortunately, due to recent events, and Coleyville and other locations, um, there's more that, that's on our plate. A um, Couple other thanks just before I begin. Uh, we've got partners in New Jersey. Um, Robert Wilson, who's the security director for the Jewish Federation of Greater Metro West, New Jersey. Bugged Monahan, director of security for the Jewish Federation of Southern New Jersey. And Amy Keller, director of security for Jewish Federation in the heart of New Jersey. I know we've expanded this presentation to include your membership. Uh, we wanna be good partners across the river. So for those institutions that are in New Jersey, please follow up with your own security directors for in-person training. Glad to have you here. And then last but not least, because of the demand on active shooter training, we're adding uh, someone else to our team, uh, Kathleen Thompson, a retired 30-year veteran of the New York City Police Department, assigned to the Counterterrorism Division way back in 2005, and an original member of New NYPD Shield. Uh, she is trained uh, in, uh, in a variety of active threat um, type capabilities and has, has conducted a thousand classes with 35 students, 35,000 students uh, over the years, um, crazed courses. She'll be joining our team. So as we schedule these in-person trainings, uh, Kathleen will be, be joining us. So glad to have you on board. All right, well, with that, um, let me quickly turn things over to my colleague, Bill Hayes, who is our Westchester and Bronx Regional Manager. Um, formerly, he was the executive director for the Westchester County District Attorney's Office, their countywide intelligence center. He was also formerly the chief of police in, in Bedford. Um, he's a graduate from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. And he also uh, is a craze certified trainer. So we're lucky to have him on our team here. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to, to Bill. He's gonna walk you through this active shooter training. And again, we'll do a Q&A afterward. So please put your, your questions in the chat. Um, Bill, over to you. Thanks, Mitch. Welcome everybody. Uh, we have uh, a thousand participants today. It's great to see the, the level of interest because this is uh, really important information that we really wanna share and uh, have the entire community to have access to. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I was uh, the executive director of the Westchester Intelligence Center following a uh, almost 30 year career as a police officer. Uh, did some work in the counterterrorism space. I was co chair of New York State Counterterrorism Zone 3. Um, you know, taken a variety of courses and trainings, and I've been a certified instructor since way before I had any of those fancy titles uh, when I was an entry level police officer. Um, all the way back as far as 1993, I've been doing training of all different kinds to, to sworn and uh, unsworn audience as well. So welcome aboard. We've got a short amount of time to transfer a whole lot of information, and I'm hoping that I can just plant the seed for you to be uh, curious and continue to access security-related training and get involved in your organization's security. So a little bit of housekeeping. 
um, about us, the Community Security Initiative. We are based in New York. Um, we cover uh, the New York City, five boroughs, Long Island, that's Nassau and Suffolk County, and Westchester County. And it's a joint project of the UJA Federation and the JCRC of New York. And our goal is to enhance security in your organization by improving the physical security of your institution, providing training such as this program. Uh, we have a threat intelligence program. We have a cyber assessment program. We assist with grant applications, um, a lot of connectivity with law enforcement liaison. Um, we have an emergency communication system so we can push out real time alerts to the community and um, and we just we do our best to answer the demand from the community and and the needs that we observe as we continue to do our work so today being our two-year anniversary um, we've seen the, the the role of csi in the community grown and i i foresee that continuing and, and we're here for you so and again the training we're, we're providing today is based on a program called Craze. It's considered a best practice in the industry. We do our best to provide the best, most current information to you. Certainly, it's not a certification course. This is for informational purposes only, um, and it's not a substitute for live training. But like Mitch explained, um, it's really easy to get a thousand people on a Zoom. It's much more challenging to train a thousand people live in a, in a timely manner. So this is one avenue that we use to try and reach as many people as we can. So the buzzword after the Colleyville uh, hostage taking is active shooter training, active shooter training. If you only had a minute to spare, I want to just give you an introduction to active shooter training in a nutshell in the first 60 seconds that we're together today. Most active shooter events are over within five minutes. Over 35% end in less than two. They're rare, but they happen. When attending a mass gathering, scan for escape routes and other places that might provide protection. Pre-planning will shorten your reaction time and help overcome the tendency to freeze. Survival is tied to action. Run if you can. It makes you a harder target and puts distance between you and the attacker. Don't hesitate, seconds matter. If running is too risky, hide in a secure place. Lock or barricade yourself in. Turn off the lights and silence phones. Then plan an attack strategy in case the shooter enters. Fighting is always your last resort, but if you must, empower yourself. Find something to use as a weapon and don't fight fair. First responders will be on the scene within minutes. Until then, it's up to you. Go to fbi.gov survive to learn more. So every congregant, every member, every staffer should have that kind of wired into them, that run, hide, fight, if you only had 60 seconds to share really important information on how to respond to an active shooter attack, that video, which is available on YouTube, it's publicly available. Great job by the FBI in producing it. Um, and, and I'd love to see that, that pushed out far and wide because it's concise and to the point. We're going to dig deeper into those things, but it's important that everybody at least have those basic concepts of running, hiding, or fighting, depending on the situation when you're presented with an active attacker. But we're going to expand beyond that a little bit today. We're going to talk about uh, the role history has to play in our preparation, talk about creating a culture of security in your organization, how to prepare. We talk about access control, which is a critical piece of preventing an attack. If you can't prevent an attack, we're certainly going to talk about how to respond to attack and speak a little bit further about planning and training and some of the things that CSI is going to do to address the community's needs. One of the best things I heard coming out of uh, Collierville was the FBI director was addressing a webinar produced or, or hosted by the ADL. And he said the best time to patch the roof is when the sun is shining before the storm. And that's extremely important. Um, the relationships, the planning, all the things you need to do are best done not during a crisis. All the handshakes that you have to make with your security professionals, with your local law enforcement, with the fire department should all be done in advance. And if we look at an event, an active shooter attack, and I don't like to use the word active shooter because it could be another type of weapon. It could be a knife. It could be a ballpoint pen. It could be a baseball bat. Anybody who is actively killing people or harming people, we consider an active attacker. But if we look in, in this illustration of time as a continuum, we are talking about today the active threat response. 
but we really ideally don't want you to get into this red zone. We want your efforts and your energy to be spent on the left side of left of boom, we say in the business, on the preparation side, making sure that you and everybody in your organization has basic security awareness training. That's not what we're doing today. You should be engaged in the planning process to make sure that your institution has a plan in place. Other training like situational awareness training, learning about what pre-attack indicators look like so you can prevent an attack, getting involved in applying for grants and funding for your institution so you can harden your target. We certainly would prefer that the attacker remain outside a really secure door rather than getting inside and force you into a position where you have to respond to an attack. Nonetheless, sometimes it happens. And that's why we're here today. And we're going to talk about active threat response, but the post-attack training doesn't end there either. We have and will continue to offer programs like Stop the Bleed, uh, even Narcan training to prevent overdoses, conduct tabletop exercises and drills, but those are really on the response side. And it's important that we understand, all of us here, and you when you go back to your organizations and engage in the planning process, that response is not prevention. We all would benefit from prevention. And we should train and work towards doing all the things that will prevent an attack. We, every, every organization, your professional staff, most of them are probably required to take some form of sexual harassment training, workplace violence training. Why don't we engage in that level of training mandatory once or twice a year, just so these things stay fresh in our mind and we can protect, prevent an attack? A lot of folks will say, if we're at this stage where there's an active shooter attack happening, it's been a failure in security. So let's work really hard together to improve security. And history is a really good teacher. Um, you know, the old phrase, those can, who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. What do we know about the past? Pittsburgh, Poway, California, the stabbing at Kabat HQ, Muncie in 2019 during Hanukkah. All of these were attacks where people got injured. Colleville is the one that's freshest in our mind, but we're really fortunate. And Colleville is a great case study because it was not an active attack. It was a hostage taking. It easily could have transitioned into an active attack. And based on some of the offender's behaviors towards the end of this incident, things were starting to look like he may have been going active and was getting ready to hurt people. Fortunately, that didn't happen. The outcome of, of that incident told us a few things. There are no new or urgent lessons to be learned, but it did reaffirm and reinforce that a lot of the commonly applied security best practices that we've been pushing out to the community are important and they're valid. And the active threat training was still a benefit. Having exposure to this kind of information, even if you're not directly involved in an active threat situation, can translate into other areas of security and prevention. It all starts with culture. Your organization um, is a community and that community should have a culture of security. Uh, and that, that culture starts with the board, um, it's ideal and it's recommended that you have a dedicated committee committed to security and safety, create policies and procedures that address your security processes. Um, working with CSI, we can help you move in that direction. The important thing is everybody should know that security is everybody's responsibility, not just the facilities person, not just the security people, it's a community-wide responsibility. And I like to use this illustration. Think about your favorite sports team. If you're not into organized sports, how about your favorite musical group or band. Think about that level of professionalism. And this is the, the way I illustrate the culture, agency or institutional culture does not have a beginning or an end. It's really a steady state. So when you think about your favorite athlete or team or musician, do they get good at what they do and then stop practicing? No, certainly not. They practice, they train every single day of their careers in order to maintain that level of proficiency. Likewise, security is not a spectator sport. It requires the full involvement of the entire community. And everybody has to recognize that without a secure environment, you don't have freedom, you don't have safety, you don't have religious liberty. So it should be important to everyone and the organization can do a lot to get that message out to everybody. We look at security as a system of different layers consisting of not only hardening the actual target, making sure your doors and your windows are secure, but being able to get out in front of an attack through providing important threat intelligence by trying to detect suspicious activity in advance of an attack, working with law enforcement and also internal stakeholders to make sure that we're prepared for a response, creating safe zones within our building and so forth. So there's a lot to it, has a lot of moving parts, and that's why you really need a 
planning team, to involve your clergy, your administration, your lay leaders, staff, facilities people, local law enforcement, fire departments, security professionals, whoever is a stakeholder in your organization's success should be involved in your planning. In preparation, a lot of these things are just the starting point to be ready uh, to prevent an attack. Like I said earlier, basic security awareness training, being alert to pre-attack indicators, working on things like we're doing today, active attack response, first aid. Uh, Homeland Security has a great, uh, we'll push the link out, um, information piece on uh, called You Are the Help Until Help Arrives. Think about how much time it takes in your community for law enforcement to respond. In an urban area, it might be three to five minutes. In a more rural or suburban area, it could take 15 minutes for the police to arrive. So you have to be ready to sustain yourself for at least that long. And a lot of folks forget about recovery. What happens after the fact? How do we get everybody back home safe? How do we make sure that we've accounted for everyone? How do we take care of everybody's psychological and mental well-being in the aftermath of something terrible like an active attack? Communications are critical internally and externally. Um, in your planning process, identify who you have to communicate with. Internally, it might be staff, members, uh, the building at large. Um, what, are your, what are your systems? Do you have a PA system? Do you have walkie-talkies? Do you have some other type of communications like WhatsApp groups or some other uh, uh, cell phone based system? How about your external stakeholders? How do you communicate with the police department, the fire department, and other important stakeholders in your community? Do you have the police chiefs or some liaison, an assigned liaison at the local police department? Do you have their cell phone? Do you know how to reach the important decision makers in the police or fire departments off hours when they're not normally working? Do you have the ability to call 911? Do you authorize your staff to call 911? It sounds like an elementary question, but there are organizations that dictate that only the boss can dial 911. And you know, Murphy's Law, when that happens, uh, when something bad happens, usually the boss is out sick on vacation or unavailable. And there are real world stories where people have been killed because of a flawed policy that prohibits people, anyone from calling 911. So we encourage that at the policy level, you encourage and authorize every single person in your building to dial 911. We hire and we train competent and qualified people to work for us. We think that they should be trusted to know when it's an emergency and dial 911. Here at CSI, we have dedicated regional managers for Nassau and Suffolk, Westchester, and all the five boroughs. Get to know your regional security manager. I cover Westchester and the Bronx. Our contact information is on the screen right now. And um, we are glad to hear from you. We, we continue to make new friends and, and build partnerships. And uh, we are doing substan substantive work, excuse me, that's bringing um, safer conditions to all of your organizations. Um, panic buttons. Do you have panic buttons in your institution? Uh, do you have the regional security managers on your cell phone? And over on the left there, look at the, the bullet point about floor plans, critically important that the police have access to a floor plan for your institution. Having those floor plans on site only will prevent the important people from having them when they need it. Having those plans accessible off site, even if it's electronically available, is critically important. Um, also, again, from Colleyville, uh, the CCTV system that they had installed was accessible remotely and, and the police had eyes on the situation at all times. And that's not always the case. Sometimes there are no cameras or the camera system doesn't support that. So we want to work towards uh, having that capability in every organization. Some other lessons that came out of Colleyville, access control is critically important. The offender in that case didn't break into the building. He was granted access. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, in, in Colleyville, the, the Rabbi Charlie had excellent relationships with elected officials and local government and first responders, had the police chiefs a cell phone number and actually communicated with the police chief while he was inside the building uh, and training, 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 training. The, uh, the survivability of everybody present there in Collierville was uh, improved and enhanced and made possible because of the training that they had received and the ability to keep their wits about them and rely on the lessons that they learned in a lot of the training that they had access to. So we talk about access control. Access control is the, different, is the difference between life and death. It's the difference between a successful attack and another one. Out of the four images there, three of those images 
are places where fatal attacks occurred. One of those images, Halle, Germany, is a attack that was thwarted by a locked door. An offender came to, to the synagogue during the high holidays, tried to gain access, had uh, improvised explosive devices, had firearms, and because of the policy to keep the door locked and because the door and lock that was in use at that time was of sufficient quality and it was security rated, an attack was prevented. We wanna see that in every institution. But sometimes we've gotta let people in. We, we're welcoming, we're warm, we wanna be able to be accessible to the community. So how do we do that? Um, we don't want anybody that's unauthorized to be on your premises. So we encourage you to divide psychologically in your own mind, kind of picture three buckets. One is a bucket of people that you know. The second bucket is the people that are known unknowns. These are people that might not be your regulars. They might not be there every day for a minion or every Shabbat for services, but they might be guests for a bat mitzvah or a bar mitzvah or guests at a wedding or some other special occasion, or it might be high holiday services. They're people that should be there, but you don't really know them. And then we have the unknowns. These are the strangers. Um, I always like to use the known traveler analogy. There's a program, I use it, that allows me to skip the security line, have expedited security when I'm getting on a plane. And when I come back into the country, I don't have to talk to a human. I just go to the kiosk, I scan my passport and off I go back out to home. So I'm a known traveler. You have known travelers. You have people that you know are in your environment every day. The problem is, is and you should develop a screening profile that's unique to your institution for each bucket. How do we, how do we scrutinize those we should scrutinize while not impeding or interfering or creating an environment that slows down or creates a negative vibe for people that should be inside the building. Um, and that's, that's fluid. That depends on your organization. It's unique to your location and your environment. What's important to note here though, is we all as humans, we've got certain primal responses. We, with kids, we, we called it stranger danger. Um, we each have an inner voice and we have gut instinct. It is scientifically proven. It's part of the limbic system, not to get too detailed, but we have what's called the gut instinct. It's proven, it's not theoretical. The problem is in modern society, we tend to be socialized and trained from childhood to ignore or disregard those primal warning signs that were really useful back in the caveman days, but maybe not so useful in a modern society where we don't wanna appear rude, we don't wanna to appear to be biased or insensitive to a person that's truly in need, so we tend to suppress those natural instincts and criminals take advantage of this. We all, even people trained like law enforcement professionals and intelligence professionals fall victim to normal human failings at any given time. Last Friday, who knew I was gonna be able to use this example, but I was coming out of a store with my wife. I came out the door, I had a bag in my right hand, the door swung out to the left. I turned to the left to hold the door open for my wife not really picking up on the fact that there was somebody sizing me up for a robbery. Fortunately, my wife saw him, was looking in the right direction. And as he closed the distance while he was trying to flank me in my blind spot over my right shoulder, my wife was able to move into position, make eye contact and thwart the attack. Just an example of how no matter how hard we try, we're all humans and we're subject to human failing. So that's why we have to be prepared for someone to violate our space. So how do we do this? We've got to strike that balance between being warm and welcoming and safe and secure. It can be done. Think Disney, think Walmart, think any other institution that welcomes people into their space, but are known for being pretty darn secure. We can do that too at the local community level. Even just making eye contact. I told you my wife making eye contact and moving into the space between me and my potential robber made all the difference. He was thwarted, he moved off. Um, a lot of private corporations, commercial businesses, and not-for-profit organizations that have a lot of traffic rely on the power of just making eye contact and saying hello. Just saying hello or starting a casual conversation for an individual sends a message, provides an opportunity for you to observe and establish a connection. It also creates a situation in which you're telling the offender, I see you but it can be done in a way that's not offensive to somebody who's not a potential offender. Uh, DHS uses the ONO acronym. You observe, initiate a hello, navigate the risk and obtain help if necessary. You're able to 
that hello process enables staffers to observe and evaluate suspicious behaviors, empowering your staffers, your volunteers, your ushers, your security personnel to lower the risk and authorize them to make help, to seek help when necessary. This just reinforces the basic principle that security starts at the portal. We don't want anybody beyond that portal into our institution. But sometimes it happens. We're gonna to have to react at some point or at least be prepared to react to an attack. And let's look specifically at some of those response options that we'd like you to remember. First though, you should know that survivability in an attack is directly related to a few things. The first is how quickly the police can arrive. We have no control over that. And response time varies based on a number of things, such as the, uh, the environment, urban, suburban, rural. Are there other emergencies in progress at the same time? Are the, where does the distance at the moment the call comes in from the nearest police officer to the location? So there's gonna be an incident start time X and a law enforcement response time of Y we can't control that, so you need to own everything in between that time, between the X and the Y. So we can control target availability. That's one thing we can control, and there's a couple of different ways we can do that. Before we do, though, let's understand how humans react during stressful situations, and nobody would argue that an active attack is not a stressful, stressful situation. A lot of research has been done in this area on who survives and who dies during disasters and attacks. And a three-phase process has been identified that everybody goes through during these events. People that survive tend to go through these phases faster and take better actions at the decisive moment because they prepared beforehand. Attending trainings like this one that we're conducting right now is part of that preparation. A lot of people don't admit in the initial stages that there's a disaster or that there's something wrong happening or underestimate the severity of a disaster. Again, we're all humans. This is a natural thing. And as a result, we delay taking action. And a lot of times this delay costs lives. In the World Trade Center disaster, people called family members to check in with them, logged off of their computers, packed up their briefcases before beginning to evacuate. Why do we do this? It's natural human behavior and there's a reason for it. It's called normalcy bias. We want things to fit into existing patterns and new experiences confuse us. Our brain tries to define disasters or emergencies as something else that we're already familiar with. For example, in an active attack where there's gunshots being fired, a lot of people describe hearing shots but thinking it's fireworks or maybe a, a muffler backfiring outside. And that's because the brain's more easily adaptable to fitting experiences into pre-existing patterns rather than dealing with something new. We're also social animals. We look around at other people for clues about how to behave. And this happens in an emergency too especially during new or ambiguous situations. Think about it, anytime you might've been at, let's say a large event, a formal dinner party, uh, some kind of large public thing, there's plates, glasses, silverware on the table. And if you're unsure, as I am most of the time about which utensil to use, which glass to use, which one is my bread plate, what do we do? We look at our neighbor and we see what other people are doing. And we do the same thing during a disaster. Doing the right thing at the right time, though, can save a lot of people. Remember, in novel or ambiguous situations, we look to others for information on how to act. And sometimes those people aren't acting appropriately for a situation. So we can't depend on that. If others are doing nothing, you will tend to do nothing. And that may not be an appropriate response. If others are acting, you may follow suit, but we can't depend on that. This is the transition from denial, ah, it must be fireworks, to deliberation. We recognize there's a problem and we need to work towards making a decision. We're not denying, we're starting to realize the problem, don't know what to do yet, but once we get past denial and into deliberation, we're starting to take actions that are life-saving. Um, but we've gotta be able to do this fast. And if we're under stress, we tend to shut down our cognitive functions. So at rest, and think about your body at rest when nothing's going on and then you're startled quickly, you're gonna get an increased stress response. Um, let's say you're home alone, you hear a noise, hear it again. Sounds like something's outside. Sounds like maybe there's a burglar around my house. Or you hear somebody sliding the screen or you hear glass breaking on the door, then somebody comes in the house. We go from that normal resting heart rate into a stressful condition. Our heart starts to beat faster. Uh, our fine motor skills deteriorate. And our complex motor skills deteriorate the more stressed out we get. And then our peak physical performance starts to, starts to suffer. And because we've never thought about this before, we've never experienced this before, 
we tend to freeze. We freeze, we don't do anything. And I just wanna show you an example from, this was the uh, kosher market uh, attack in Paris back in 2015. And I want you to pay particular attention to the lady with the stroller. That took her a few seconds to get that child out of the stroller, something she does every single day. But now she's under stress. She's under attack. She hasn't prepared for this. Most people aren't. Look at the other people in the images. They're, they're banging into each other. They're running around. They don't know what to do because they don't have this experience hardwired into their brains and they're under stress. So what do we do? What do we do? You want to keep that brain running as long as you possibly can when you're in a stressful situation. There are things you can do in order to prepare yourself. Tell yourself to calm down. Colleyville is a good example of where people who had training and had advance warning on what to do during an emergency situation kept their wits about them. They really did. For 11 hours, they kept their wits about them. Deep breathing exercises. Um, breathe in through your nose. Hold it for two seconds. Breathe out your mouth. This can slow your heart rate. rate. It can oxygenate your brain and it can put you in a condition where you're more perceptive, more perceptive during an emergency. Recognize that you're going to be scared. You can change that into, product, into a productive emotion like anger. Staying fit certainly helps. Research, research has shown that people who are fit are generally more able to cope with stress and they're better able to take action when necessary. No matter what, eventually people get placed under enough stress that the human brain, their natural human instincts tend to shut down. So we want to try and delay that as long as we can. One of the, the, the cool things that we are capable of is, is changing that, preventing that shutdown during a stressful situation. One of the things you can do, if you see the, the word script, scripting means thinking through, working through if-then scenarios, ima imaginary, in your mind, so that you have a better plan ready. Practicing reinforces that plan. So if you're sitting in your office, if you're sitting in shul, what, play the what if game. Professionals, security professionals, law enforcement officers are trained to do this. What if this? What if somebody comes in through that door? What if somebody comes through that window? What if there's a fire? Where will I go? Preparing in advance, creating these scenarios in your mind will create an environment where you're better able to adapt because you've built a pattern in your brain for it. So once we've gotten through the denial stage and we realize something's wrong, you've got to commit to action. And we like the acronym run, hide, and fight. There are a lot of other ones out there, avoid, deny, defend. Um, it doesn't matter. These are semantics. It doesn't really make a difference as long as you remember what to do because the core concepts and principles of, are the same. If you can, we want you to create as much time, distance, and shielding from the threat. How do you do that? The best thing you can do if the conditions permit is to run, get out of the threat, get out of the, away from the hazard as soon as you can. Knowing your exits in advance, this is part of scripting, will help you get out of the threat, get out of the hazard as quick as you can and call 911. This is the exterior of the store in Paris and you'll notice people on the street, see the guy going into the gun, they flee and you'll see people coming out the door of the store in just a few moments because they recognize what's going on and they're running and they're putting as much time and distance between them and the hazard as possible. So there's your first option, and that's your most beneficial option uh, if you can take advantage of that. You may not have that opportunity, though. You may be blocked from the exit. There may be something that prevents you from running away. What do you do then? Well, first of all, let me just throw this little tip in there. Um, it's important to know your exits. Again, talking about scripting, this is a great tool that we learned from a synagogue. It's a sample seating chart, an evacuation chart based on seating in a synagogue. And the synagogue seating is broken up into zones and each zone is assigned an exit. And this provides information for everybody that's seated to know, number one, where their nearest exit is. It also prevents everybody heading for the same exit at the same time. It's much easier to disperse a crowd of people through four different exits than through a single portal. And in this particular case, this is uh, laminated on a card, just like you would have in the seat back of an airplane. Uh, seat pocket of an airplane. Um, and it gives everybody the opportunity to review emergency procedures, 
um, as part of services, an announcement is made. Let's remember where the fire exits are. In your seat pocket, there's an emergency exit chart. Please familiarize yourself with it. And this is important for what it doesn't matter what it is, a fire, a blackout, a storm. Um, we naturally are going to try and go out through the exit door that we entered in an emergency. That, might, that may not be the most appropriate way to get out the door. It's also important to make sure that your exit routes are clear. I've been to a lot of institutions where emergency routes are designated and exits are in place that have good hardware and they're safe routes to, to get out of a building. But these exit pathways are being used to store things or they're, they're, they're blocked by some sort of debris or stored items. And we wanna get those exit routes clear. Um, so still talking about run, remember the exit you come in may not be the best exit to go out through in an emergency. I want you to look at what's going on here in this image. There's a, a, a lady and a child in the right hand side of the image. And they're in a, there's an attack going on and they came through the door into the storage area and then they stopped and covered their eyes. That's the stress response kicking in. Um, but look around that room. Don't limit yourself to the doors that you usually use. Think about secondary exits, windows, fire escapes. Um, in some cases, you can even break through drywall. Um, in this image, it doesn't look like, and there's a video to support this, it doesn't look like these individuals ever truly checked to see if this exit door was locked or not. You can see a push bar there. And there's a ladder that probably goes up to the roof or a fire escape. These are options to continue running. But under stress, simple things aren't that simple. And that's why we encourage you to think about these things in advance, because at some point to survive an attack, you have to be willing to commit to action. Sometimes running is not an option, though. We acknowledge that. In that case, you want to try your best to hide from the hazard, hide from the attacker, barricade yourself behind something that's impermeable. Lock the door, turn out the lights, get out of sight, make yourself as invisible as possible. Think about the prior image. Uh, actually, I'm going to pull that image up in just a second. Um, a simple locked door can and has prevented active shooter suspects from getting to potential victims. So I can't stress enough the importance of locking the door. And in order to lock the door, you have to have working locking hardware. Also, how is the door locked? Are you locking it with a key? Where's the key kept? Is it an external lock? Is it an internal lock? Um, and what's out of sight? Are you locking yourself in a room with glass windows or interior glass partitions that an offender can see? Those things may not provide the cover that you need. If you get inside an area where you can hide, barricading yourself in there is even better. The heavier object you put by the door, the more objects you put by the door. Um, I even put an image of door stops in here. And in most circumstances, I'm not a fan of door stops because I usually see door stops being used to hold doors open that shouldn't be held open and thus creating a security hazard. But in this case, a simple door stop can tighten up a door closure and prevent an attacker from getting in. Inward opening doors are easier to barricade than outward opening doors. So it's important for you to recognize the door that you're using is an inward opening or outward opening when you're in a particular environment. So again, if we decided that the exit door and the ladder aren't there, and these folks that are hiding in this room, first of all, left the, the door open, and there's a lot of debris there that prevents it, but there's objects here that can be used to create a barricade. Um, it looks like these are carts that they're storing inventory on. So you have to be active in your denial of the suspect's access to you and, and make sure that those have, that have decided to hide with you assist you in that. Active participation in saving yourself is an ongoing process, right? You're under stress. You have to be constantly looking for what can be done next. What's next? I've done this. What's next? Hiding and covering your face isn't going to do it. It's not going to stop the, inev the inevitable. A secure, sturdy barrier will. Simple things. Closing, locking doors can keep an attacker out. Um, but when you're under stress, you're not going to be able to come to that realization unless you think about it in advance. Outward opening doors present a particular challenge. Um, there are things you can do to hold that door closed. Uh, using ropes, tension sleeves, even a belt from somebody's pants can be used to pull a door closed like the gentleman in this image. There are also commercially available locks out there that can be activated simply by pushing a button. The important thing is, is when you're locking a door, you want to have that locking effort 
done in the easiest, most intuitive way possible. Pushing a button is the easiest way to do it. Um, but whatever you decide to install, these are all commercial products. There's no one or another that we recommend more than the other. That's not what they're in business, not what we're in the business to do. But it's important when you're making decisions on what locks to put on your interior doors that you engage with your local building department, your local fire department, whoever does the codes enforcement, because not every city, not every town or village is going to have the same building regulations. So we can't run, we can't hide. What do we have left to do? We have to protect ourselves. We have to fight. Um, in this video, this gentleman is looking for alternatives. He realizes he can't go anywhere. There's no place to hide. Once he realizes the cell phone's not any good to him, he grabs that bottle of wine off the shelf and he's ready to go to work. He's made a commitment to action. He's going to defend himself. In reality, this gentleman real, later on, before he engaged with the offender, determined that he was better able to avoid and get out of harm's way. And he ran down an aisle and escaped out the back of the store. Um, but in contrast, look at the lady in the blue coat. As this gentleman has made his commitment to action, look in the upper frame of the image and you'll see a group of people, they've decided they've found an option to run. And again, a stress response. We've stopped thinking now, heart rate is up, breathing heavy, and the woman in the blue coat lays down and plays dead. Playing dead is a flawed tactic. Uh, it doesn't work. We don't want you doing that. Um, so if you decide you have to fight, fight as if your life depends on it. Um, if you know the offender's coming into the room that you're hiding in, stand near the door. Not across the room. If you're across the room, you present a target. If you're close, you have a chance to fight. If you're far, you can get hurt. If the offender comes in the room with a gun, grab it. Don't be afraid. Grab the gun. Don't let go and point it away from people. Fight for your life. It's not a fair fight. And this is one of those cases where the only fair fight is the one you win and you have to win. Improvise, do everything you have to do. Gouge eyes, bite, kick, pull hair, it doesn't matter. You need to win this one. You have to be able to shift your emotions from fear to anger and then channel this anger into something productive to focus all that energy and aggression solely upon your survival and that attacker. It's a great uh, real life story of an individual that was caught in a situation, a police officer, um, he was losing this fight and he made a decision. I'm not going out in the parking lot. I'm not going out like this. I'm not going to let my wife down. I'm not going to orphan my daughter. Um, he committed to action. Um, this is all about mindset. And it's important to know that if you get shot, if you get stabbed, if you get hurt, it doesn't mean you're going to die. You have to keep fighting. Um, in my mind, um, although as I get older, I know that any fight I get into, chances are I'm getting hurt. I'm probably going to lose. But I've made a commitment in my mind, and I'd like you to make the same commitment that um, anybody that's going to hurt me, anybody that's going to try to kill me, they're going to have to earn it. I'm not just going to give it to them. And uh, there's going to be a cost. Um, so you have to fight as if your life depends on it. Um, and it doesn't matter where you are and, and what, it, what it is that you use to protect yourself. Rabbi Charlie threw a chair. Great decision. Kept his wits about him. If nothing else, it provided a moment of distraction where he interrupted the hostage takers thinking, and they were able to seize a moment and go out and get out the door. Um, in June 19, uh, 2017, there was an incident in the area of London Bridge and an individual rammed pedestrians in a vehicle. Uh, he crashed the vehicle. The attackers, actually it was multiple attackers. They jumped out, they had knives. I believe they were duct taped into their hands at this time. Um, they made a mistake and went into a pub. What do you find in a London pub? Bar stools and pint mugs and guess what the people in that pub used against these offenders. They threw pub, my, uh, pub um, excuse me, pint mugs and bar stools at the attackers and the, the terrorists promptly exited. Um, similarly, in December, 2019, a shooter in an exterior environment, and this is the photo, was subdued using a narwhal tusk. A narwhal is, a, is an ocean mammal with a huge tusk on the front. And I don't even remember how this individual had access to the tusk. It was either through a museum or something like that. And um, this individual used what he had at his disposal. The other gentleman there is using a fire extinguisher. What do you have in your environment? Books, prayer books. Uh, take a look in the office or the home or the building you're in right now. What do you have at your disposal that you can grab and use to protect yourself? Is it a ballpoint pen? Is it a kitchen knife? 
where are the exits in the environment that you are in right now listening to this presentation? Where will you go if you had to get out of there? Where would you go if you had to fight right now? And how would you defend yourself if you had to right now? That's part of that what if game and scripting that you can actually habituate to the point where you're doing it all the time and you don't even notice it. Think about driving a car. A red light presents itself to you at an intersection. You don't really think about it. You slow the car, you put on the brake and you stop. And you do all that in, in milliseconds without even thinking about it. The takeaway here is what you do matters. This is a diagram of the classrooms in the second floor of the Virginia Tech building where they had an active shooter, um, Norris Hall. Um, in that case, an individual had killed two students earlier in the morning in a dorm building and then went into a classroom building and continued his attack. Now, the suspect first entered room 206, then 207, then 211. Everybody in 211 was shot and killed or shot and wounded. This was the third room that was attacked and it was revisited by the suspect two more times. In 204, um, I'm going to mess up his name, but Professor Levio Lebrescu's classroom, he was a hero. He blocked the door. He held the door closed while 10 of his students escaped um, out through a window. Professor Lebrescu and another student were killed and, another, and, and four were wounded, but 10 of them got out alive. His delaying action saved lives. Um, in 205, 205 was a complete denial because they blocked the door early on. They must have known what was going on. Um, 205, 206, excuse me, 206, 207, 211 got attacked. 205 was last, later in the attack, but the students laid on the floor, put their feet against the door and they held it closed. He tried shooting through the door, but because they were laying down, nobody was injured by the gunfire in the room. So this is a, a really important um, illustration that supports the fact that what you do matters. Taking action early matters, it saves lives. At some point, the attack is going to end. Attacks usually take less than five minutes, and they're terminated either by the suspect's own actions, they kill themselves, by another person intervening and interrupting that attack, or by police arriving. It's important that you know what the police are going to do and what their expectations are going to be when they get there. Remember, the police are experiencing all of the stress symptoms that we talked about before. For most of them, it's the first time they have ever been involved in this situation, only they're trained and equipped to deal with it. They don't know who the bad guys are. They don't know who the good guys are, so make it easier for them. Be prepared to follow commands. Show your palms. Don't move. You may be handcuffed. Just go with it. Don't fight the process. It'll all get sorted out later. Um, and you might be told to do things by the police that violate your organization's policy. That's okay. We have a life and death situation here. The police have a better awareness of what's going on than you do, so just go along with it. The law enforcement focus in their initial response is going to be to immediately stop the killing. Stop that attacker from doing what they're doing. Stop the dying and get aid to the most critically injured as quickly as possible and evacuate the injured. However, that's going to take time. It takes time. EMS is going to be delayed. People need help. And the important thing to do to close that gap is to, to get as many people exposed to simple, accessible training like Stop the Bleed. Stop the Bleed is um, basically just training to teach you how to stop um, massive bleeding, life-threatening bleeding, and apply a tourniquet. And this has proven to save lives. And it's very simple. Um, CSI has facilitated this through online training. And now that we're starting to reemerge after COVID back into the live environment, we expect that we're going to be able to do this again in cooperation with some medical providers in the area. I mentioned earlier, there are going to be post-incident impacts. You should expect there will be mental trauma. Um, and that's why it's important that you have a plan for that. You're going to have to deal with how would you reunify if you're in a school environment, if you're in a house of worship, if you're in an office, how are you going to reunify and account for everybody that has now scattered to the wind if they've taken the run option and gone through different doorways? How are you going to deal with crisis communications? And that includes the media and your internal and external stakeholders. And how will you resume and continue the operations as soon as possible of your shul, of your school, of your agency, of your office? So these are things that have to be considered in advance. People are going to experience shock, 
guilt, PTSD, night, nightmares, you got to have a plan in place. So um, best practice is requiring everybody who is involved in a situation like this to attend at least one private counseling session to help assess where they're at. A lot of people um, are going to need your help in a time like this. What do we want you to do? What should you do next? Subscribe to our email list. Any of your regional managers can get you on the list. If you go to our website, um, jcrcny.org slash security, you can get on our email list. You should request, if you haven't already, a physical and cyber assessment of your facility. You should develop a security plan and do everything you can to harden your facility. Some of the things you need to do to make your facility more secure are expensive. We know that, and that's why there are great opportunities out there. Um, the national, the federal nonprofit security grant program, uh, which used to be $90 million, is now bumped up to $180 million, and there are uh, proposals to increase that to $360 million, and that's probably going to pass. Um, so the, the recognition is there at the congressional level that security is important and security is expensive, and these funds are being made available. We can help you with that. I mentioned having facility floor plans off-site is critical and having those available to law enforcement and then train, 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 just like your favorite athlete and your favorite musicians. So I like sports analogies. Vince Lombardi says practice does not make perfect. Only perfect practice makes perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect and you got to do it frequently. We're going to continue to run like we have in the past active shooter training events like this, um, as well as in partnership with the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we have run the Stop the Bleed training. We're going to continue to do that. Um, and remember, you are the help until help arrives. There is uh, training available for that in coordination with local hospitals and DHS. And we are rolling out in-person training events to talk about things like this, what to do in the event of an active attack. And the, to wait, the way to access that training is through your local regional security manager or directly through our service request link on the website. So in summary, we talked about a, lot, about a lot of things today. We want to create a culture of security. That's the foundation. If you're going to build a good house, you've got to have a good foundation. We know that you have to strike a balance between being warm and welcoming and safe and secure. It can be done. You want to make sure that unauthorized people don't get into your premises, period, the end. It's the best way to prevent an attack. Work with your regional security manager. Call your regional security manager as soon as it's safe after calling 911. Know where your exits are. Know what your options are. Run, hide, fight. Make sure you have plans. Make sure you know where your communications channels are going to be. Make sure you, you know where your equipment is and that it works. And be prepared to fight like your life depends on it, because it may. We know there are grant programs coming out soon. We're going to keep you informed on that. Um, our website is there, jcrc.org slash security grants. Um, and I believe we're going to move towards Q&A as soon as I stop sharing my screen. So off to you, over to you, Seth. Thank you, Bill. So let's jump right in and see how many questions we can get through here. I have a bunch of them to uh, start going through. First one. Isn't the lesson from Beth Israel in Texas to be careful who you were letting into the building? Access control. Access control. Who you let into your building makes all the difference. Um, it's challenging. Um, I don't know the physical layout at Beth Israel, and I don't want to use Beth Israel as the only example, but we've all done it. We've let the wrong person into our building at one point or another, or we've gotten into a situation that we realize we shouldn't have gotten ourselves into. It's a common human failing. I put myself in a bad position last Friday. But access control, a locked door, not admitting people that shouldn't be in your building will prevent an attack. Um, you know, if we were to tabletop a situation where some unknown knocks on your door and asks for help, there's a way to get that person the help they need while protecting yourself from possible criminal activity. If there's a vestibule, that person could be seated in the vestibule. If the weather's Let's say it's the weather's inclement and you can't leave them outside. The preferred thing would be to leave them outside and deal with them outside. If you have to let them in a locked vestibule, vestibule. sit here, sir, while I call the police. Sit here, sir, while I get you a sandwich. Sit here, sir, while we try to get you the help that you need. So access control comes first. And that keeps you on the prevention side on, of the attack. We want you on the left side of that continuum so that the attack doesn't happen. 
Okay, next question. Can you please clarify the difference between safety and security? Some people use them interchangeably, but I suspect that each have a distinct meaning. You know, I don't get too hung up on definitions. Security, um, you know, is usually used in the context of protecting yourself from criminal activity. Safety is more encompassing, uh, you know, to include things like fire safety, injury prevention, and so on and so forth. Okay, next question. We've not heard a lot of information about the Colleyville attack. Did the hostage taker have a loaded gun? That's a good question. We don't know. A lot of the details are yet to come out. There's a criminal investigation going on. The shooting has to be investigated. The uh, officer involved shooting. The circumstances of the hostage taking have to be investigated. And eventually that information will, will probably been, be made public to a, to a great degree. Um, the FBI has been extremely forthcoming with the information that they can release, but the criminal investigation has to take precedence. Um, we know that the Im individual was armed. Don't know if there were bullets in the gun. But I'm sure they know. Okay, next question. Can you tell those of us that are not within the Cashman area for the JCRC of New York where we can go for training and other help? David, I might uh, defer that one to you. I think that... Uh... What you should do is to uh, just send us an email at uh, uh, security.request at jcrcny.org, and we'll try to refer you to the right person. Uh, we don't have the time to kind of sort out where you are and uh, who we should re refer everyone to. Local police departments will do the training, so you might also check with your local law enforcement agency. Okay, next question. Do you recommend that our congregants carry pepper spray when they come to the temple? Unless you're trained and competent and capable, capable in using something like that, you should stick to the basics, run, hide, fight. Um, you know, we get the same question about firearms and it's a, uh, you can really go down the rabbit hole with that. The, the most competent person with a firearm is a, an active duty police officer because they have not only the, the, the skills to physically operate that device, but they also have the, the judgment training. They know the legal aspects. So don't be a hero. Get out of there. That's the most important thing. Okay, next question. What does CSI think about firearms and synagogues to protect congregants? We have a lot of former IDF and as well U.S. military members that come to synagogue. Common question. I knew that was going to come up. Um, if you're operating under the auspices of the synagogue as part of the security plan and you're armed, the synagogue owns the liability and all the, the, the things that go along with that. If you're an individual that happens to be authorized to carry a firearm, you're acting independently and on your own. And the risk there is that you may be mistaken for a bad guy when the police come. So, um, that's and then what are the policies in your synagogue? Some institutions don't allow firearms in their building. Doesn't matter who you are. All right, uh, Bill. One other thing that you know you're mentioning IDF veterans. It really doesn't count if you learned to shoot 20 years ago in the IDF. Every one of the CSI team goes to the range multiple times a year. Bill is a New York State firearms instructor. Uh, you can uh, do more damage unless you are trained and uh, uh, qualified. Uh, so, you know, if you have people who are trained and qualified, uh, there are people who have shown members from the NYPD, you know, who uh, 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 may carry a gun, but, you know, that's, they are, uh, kept up to date in their training uh, by uh, the NYPD. Uh, don't assume that just because someone was in the U.S. Army or the IDF, they know what they're doing unless they're do, uh, training on an ongoing basis. And yeah, one more thing, David, on that too. Um, rules of engagement, you know, military versus civil, civil law enforcement, completely different. So mm -hmm. the gold standard is, a uh, on-duty active duty police officer followed by an off-duty police officer followed by uh, a recently retired police officer who, who actively trains with their firearm. Okay, Bill, next question. How would you deal with outsider groups using or renting the spaces within your facility? 
And I guess what they're referencing by that is adhering to policy and making sure they're not letting people in that shouldn't. So the, the, the best practices that I've seen in that, and it's not uncommon, a lot of times the social hall is rented out for outside functions. The renter has to conform to the institution's policies. And most of the institutions that uh, I deal with, um, they require security on site and they pass that cost along to the renter. And that's, that's agreed to in advance. Um, if you start compromising, you know, we're going to have security for us, but we're going to let security lapse when we rent out. You're, you're not going to have a, a good security product at the end of that. And, and you definitely put yourself at risk. Okay. The next question really goes to uh, what happens in the emergency. And the question is, doesn't the exit depend on the location of the threat? What exit you use? Yeah, 100%. You want to go to the exit that's going to get you away from the threat. Um, again, think about the airplane analogy. If you've ever traveled by plane, when they give you that safety briefing, they tell you, remember, the nearest exit to where you are may not be in front of you. Um, and again, you know, if the, the front of the plane's on fire, you're going to go to the back. If the back of the plane is on fire, you're going to go to the front. Same thing inside the a synagogue or a social hall or a school, you're going to get away from that threat. Get to that exit that's going to get you away from the threat. Okay. You know, Bill, I just want to comment on that. We we had this come up in the uh, in the last presentation, um, <laughs> and it really comes out to situational awareness, right? Uh, too, right? Uh, so, you know, when you and I sit in a restaurant, only because of our background, we always take a look. We know where the exits are. We tend to sit in a certain spot and the and the place. But if you don't know where the exits are, if you don't have that situational awareness, it's going to be tough when there's an emergency happens. And it's much more likely to be like a fire uh, than an active shooter. But you're, you're still in the same trick bag. Uh, if a fire starts and the smoke is coming into the room already, uh, you should kind of have a sense of where you need to go to escape the danger rather than um, just running, uh, you know, without knowing where you're going. And when you sit down and, and you decide to do that, look around and find the nearest exit, make sure you pick another one too. Pick them all. Make sure you know where they all are so you have more options. The more options you have, the better decision you're going to make. Hey, Bill, next question. Do attackers cause a diversion, sometimes in a remote part of a property, to move people from their post and gain access? Sometimes. Yep. And that's, that's why having your layers pushed out as far as you can from, as far as you can on the property, gives your security, uh, paid security, your security volunteers, your members to spot something going on before it gets to your, your um, I call it the inner sanctuary and uh, it, it's really tongue in cheek. I don't necessarily mean the sanctuary in the synagogue, but your, your innermost part of the building should be the last place um, that the, the bad guys can get to. So pushing out your observation, your situational awareness, try and detect that kind of diversion taking place is important. How do you balance running and helping people? You need to run first. Um, if you can't help people, help them. But a lot of people will resist your help. Think about the lady laying down on the floor with the blue jacket. If you had the opportunity to, to grab her, drag her, um, to get her out of there, great. But people will fight you on that. And you might be in a position where you have to decide whether or not you're going to save yourself or you're going to fall victim. Okay. Will making a lot of noise or threatening moves drive off a single attacker or others? What are the circumstances? It's all, it's all contextual based. If the attacker is armed, I don't really think making noises or threatening moves is going to benefit you. It actually may be uh, to your disadvantage. Again, that's why we say look around, see what's available. Uh, one thing they found is that as long as you aim at a person's eyes, that's the first thing they will defend. So the fire extinguisher into, into the eyes, uh, you know, throwing chumashim and sidurim, prayer books at people uh, is, you know, if your life depends upon it, do it. Okay, next question. I was taught that once a criminal knows you can see and identify them, they are more likely to want to kill you. Is this correct? That's an, that's an overgeneralization. That, that really isn't true. Think back to the power of hello. 
making eye contact and letting them know that you're there in most cases. And remember, there is no hard and fast rule for anything, right? We only know what happens most of the time, most of the time. Most of the time you make eye contact with somebody and let them know that you're aware of, that, of their presence and of their intentions is going to have a discouraging impact on them. There's always the exception. Okay, next question. If you lock a door, and this is with a, either a uh, lockout or a lockdown situation, I would imagine. If you lock a door, should you worry about other people who might be in the active shooter area? You mean other potential victims? Correct. So I guess you're locking a door. I'll, and you have I'll answer that one. Someone's on the that exterior one. side of that lockdown area. Let me answer that, step. Um, and yeah. I tried to answer this in the chat for um, the person that asked that. Um, all of these scenarios, like Bill pointed out, are dynamic. And, you know, when you talk about run, hide, and fight, um, sometimes it's just a matter of you're, you might be the only one that's able to call 911 if you can get out of there. You might save a lot of lives by escaping and being the first one to call. But it's really a decision where there was another question similar. It was, what if you're in a leadership position? It really, these are all scenarios where it's sort of what if. It depends on the, the position you're in when this happens, what you can and can't do, where to go and where you can't go. And that's sort of a, you know, it may be a moral question because uh, you, you decided to run and somebody else who stayed behind maybe didn't make it. Um, and a lot of people have to deal with scenarios like that. But all of these different dynamics come into play. Um, but the whole idea that Bill's trying to, uh, and the rest of us are trying to convey is whatever you decision, whatever decision you make, make it. Think about what you might do, but you got to make that decision quickly and then go with it. Um, what you see very often is people freeze. Why? Because they can't make a decision. They don't know what to do, so they do nothing. And that's the last thing you want to do. So you can't second guess yourself once you make that decision. You have to take action. Okay, thank you, Terry. So next question, you know, we talk about securing yourself in a location, locking yourself into a room into a shelter in place area, wherever it might be when there's an active shooter situation. Can you talk about aftermarket secondary emergency locks? Do they have to comply with fire and building codes? Yep, I mentioned that during the presentation. There's a lot of commercial products out there. Um, you have to engage with your building department, your fire department, whoever does the local code enforcement in your <laughs> jurisdiction to make sure that the devices you're considering are legal. And, you know, an example, one, uh, one school district in uh, Westchester installed a bunch of one product and they were told by the fire department they had to remove all of them because they didn't pass the fire code. So there are some really terrific products out there that are, you know, certified by Underwriters Laboratory, UL. And, you know, that's a good place to start. Okay, next question. You spoke about keeping doors locked, but also needing to be warm and welcoming. How should I approach walking into the building with someone I don't know? I'm much more likely to hold the door for them. Good point. Um, this, is, this is a problem, not just in a, in a house of worship environment. Um, it's a common tactic called tailgating. Um, it happens in office buildings where, you know, particularly like, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, the lobby of a major corporation, everybody's supposed to swipe their card, um, you know, and then the door opens or the gate opens. And, you know, we, we want to be courteous. We want to be helpful and kind to our neighbor. And I think that intent and that feeling only intensifies in a, a house of worship. So who is that person that's walking with you? Are they a known are they a known unknown or are they just an unknown? And you can be tactful in letting that person know that, hey, you know, um, who are you? What are you doing here? Who are you here to see? Um, tell you what, I will want you to wait here for me. I'm going to go inside and I'll, I'll get whoever you need. Um, you, can be, you can be safe and secure and warm and welcoming and not offend anybody. But um, the scenario you're talking about is very common. 
Um, people wonder what to do in that situation. They don't want to be, they don't want to offend anybody. Um, but it's also an opportunity that criminals, it's a, it's a human behavior that criminals take advantage of frequently. Okay, thank you, Bill. So I think we're gonna to get to two more questions. What are your thoughts? Once again, this is another uh, guard question, but a little bit more expansive. What are the are your thoughts on armed versus unarmed guards? So like I said before, the, uh, the, if you would create a hierarchy, the gold standard is the armed on duty police officer followed by the off duty police officer followed by the recently retired uh, actively training police officer, and then you get down into the private security guard armed, private security guard unarmed. Um, so there's there's a sliding scale, you know, of of standards there. But remember, at the same time, that resources are limited. What's the threat you're trying to protect against? How much do you how much attention do you need to give to that? Um, how much money do you have to spend? I hate to say it, but it's a fact. Economics a lot of times have to drive those decisions. Um, but something is better than nothing. Um, there are shuls that have never had a security guard. They came upon some funding or maybe got a grant and they're at least able to afford to hire an unarmed security guard, which usually doesn't cost as much as some of the other options. Anything you do is a step in the right direction and it's an improvement. Thank you, Bill. And uh, we're just about uh, going to wrap things up in a few moments, but I just wanna let everybody know once again, please contact your regional security manager any one of the five of us for your area, contact your regional manager. If you are from outside the area, you can contact the email that uh, David provided and we can look to see if we can point you in the right direction. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Nadine from UJA Federation. Nadine. Thank you so much. I just wanna thank all of you who joined us for this important webinar. Your synagogues, day schools, yeshiva, JCC, social service agencies, Hillel's and other Jewish organizations are very fortunate to have you take the time to attend this training in order to protect yourselves and your communities. While it's my fervent hope that these trainings will not be necessary in the future, we must continue to be vigilant as prepared as you heard today. Uh, on behalf of UJA's Director of Synagogue Strategy, I want to deeply express my appreciation for our partnership with everyone at JCRC, with Mitch Silver, and the entire team at, JC, at the CSI. Um, as we mentioned, you'll receive all these resources and we are planning another webinar for next week. So please be sure to look at an email from me um, under the synagogue banner and or from CSI. Um, I'm now just going to turn it over for a few brief words from the CEO of um, JCRC NY, Gideon Taylor. Great. So look, a big uh, thank you, huge thank you to our CSI, our amazing CSI team. And I, I think we, I just want to say that we feel from JCRC and I as the exec of JCRC, uh, but I know also for our partners at UJ Federation, and as Nadine said, are just so uh, uh, grateful and appreciative for what this team does. And uh, we appreciate, uh, of course, the tremendous uh, time that you put in, the fact that almost a thousand people came uh, today uh, as an expression of the concern on the part of our community, um, but also uh, an expression that there are so many people in so many institutions that are thinking ahead, planning strategically, and we're just uh, glad that uh, at JCRC, together with Federation, through the CSI team, are uh, able to work with you, and we look forward to continuing to work with you in the community um, to try to plan for what we hope will never happen, um, but to do it and to plan in a thoughtful way. So thank you very much all for, for joining us.